Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, for gathering us here together today. As we open your word now, we ask that you'd speak to us deep within our hearts. We need your word that can bring us to life. Even more, help us to appreciate the great love that you have for us. So often we're counting ourselves out. So often we're running in anxiety and fear in our lives. And we forget that we are loved deeply by you, held secure. Help us to appreciate this once again today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Well, good morning, and happy Father's Day once again. Uh, on Tuesday, we had, um, we had our little workshop uh, and, um, on, on rhythm of life, and we had a wonderful discussion. Uh, but I also outed right at the end that my sermons have been a little bit longer of late. Yeah, and you probably noticed that. I, it's amazing that you're all here still. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't lost anybody, which is lovely. Um, uh, and I just wanted you all to know that this is not the new norm. Um, the fact is that we've been digging into this rhythm of life topic over the last number of weeks. And even though the theme is a very basic one, uh, nothing new or surprising about the things that we've been talking about. It's so important for us to pause on these things that are all too familiar to us so that we can be asking the practical question right. These practices that help us to focus and center our lives on Jesus, what do they look like now for me in my life? What do they look like going forward into this next season? These practices of worship, of prayer, and study, of service, of generosity, and of faithful living. It's so important for us just to pause and to ask that practical question. We know all of these things are important, don't we? But we don't want to have a bobble-headed kind of faith. Yes, these things are important, but we never really get around to reflecting on how we're practicing these things that we hold as important. Next slide, please, John. So we've looked at worship and prayer and study and service last week, and today we're wanting to explore the theme of generosity. Generosity. Here's a question for you. How do we become more generous? How do we become more generous? It's an odd sort of question, isn't it? In some ways, it would seem to be almost obvious. But if we just pause on it for a second, it's like, right, okay, if I'm struggling with generosity, it's not like pouring more energy into being generous or something like that. You don't get there with a five-step plan, do you? It's kind of like compassion or something like that. If we're struggling with compassion in our lives, it's not like we bear down harder, right, in order to kind of leap over that, that challenge that we have. Something else needs to happen in order to actually practice this thing that we feel is so important for our hearts to be open to it, ready to enter in most fully. How do we become more generous? Next slide, please, John. This is the specific practice that we're wanting to explore, giving as we can to support the church and other community needs locally and abroad. I would suggest to you that it's way too easy to leap ahead and start planning before we understand where the motive for generosity is meant to come from, right? The way that we're meant to be moved into generosity. You can start developing plans around all of that and miss generosity at its very root. Do you know what I mean by that? We want to help, of course, don't we? We want to offer support to our church we love and the community, and we recognize that that's all important, and we can get all the plans starting to go. I'm telling you, if we haven't thought about the motive for all of that ahead of time and really sunk into that and keep on sinking into it, you know what will develop over time? Resentment. We'll get overworked doing this kind of stuff. We'll get tired, and we will uh, get resentful partly because it will be under underappreciated in the work that we do. People won't notice in the way that we might hope. That can happen over a lifetime. It can happen within a matter of weeks. If we are behaving as if we ourselves are the source of our own generosity, we will run into a brick wall at some point. 
we will just simply run into a brick wall. So it's important to ask this question. How do we become more generous? Where does generosity really come from that won't lead us astray as we move along and as we give of ourselves sacrificially, supporting our church and abroad? Next question. Next uh, slide, sorry. <laughs> Here's what I'd like to suggest to you. A very simple a very simple answer to this question. How do we become more generous? By noticing and experiencing the generosity of God in our lives. This is how we do it. It's the very thing that we are moving past without even thinking, oftentimes in our lives, isn't it? In fact, we can do a lot of good things out of anxiety and fear, a root anxiety and fear in our lives. We can end up doing a lot of good things out of a sense of not being loved deeply in our lives. Am I preaching to the choir now? I, I know that this is true for me in my life. I know a lot of the energy that I spend on trying to do good things oftentimes comes from a, a striving, right? A striving to, to get my act together and to show other people that I've got my act together rather than allowing the overflow of God's generosity in my life to, to move out beyond me without fully even realizing it or appreciating it. This is what we want to do when it comes to generosity and this practice of generosity. It's a weird sort of thing. We want to be open, right, to the way that God would work in and through us rather than just to bear down harder and bear down harder and bear down harder in the way that we oftentimes do with other things in our lives, by noticing and experiencing the generosity of God in our lives. We've got a couple of really good examples of this in our readings for today, and that's where we want to go now. If you've got a bulletin, please get it out, because we can kind of look at that together there. You're gonna, we're going to have um, a little bit up on the screen as well. Next slide, please, John. What we want to do is look at our gospel reading for this morning. This is, I think, probably a story that's familiar to us. And we can look at this particular story from so many different angles. We've got three central characters. Simon, the Pharisee, who invites Jesus for a meal. Right? Those are our two principal characters, but also this unnamed woman who shows up and crashes the party. Right? Um, not, not intending to do that necessarily, but in effect kind of doing that by virtue of the sort of party that Simon's trying to hold in this particular moment. There are all kinds of ways to look at this, but one of the, what I really want to focus on this morning is just simply this, the generosity, the overflowing generosity of this woman. The overflowing generosity. She can't help herself. She's drawn to Jesus clearly. She's heard that Jesus is in town and is going to be at Simon's house. That might sound a little bit strange because in our, in our homes, we actually... Um, you know, don't have our, our, our doors open just to anybody to, to be part of a, but, but a public and private space that was blurry in the ancient world. Right? And so it was easy for people to kind of come into private space, what we would think of as private space, to kind of uh, notice and, and interact with people and then move on. And that's kind of what's happening here. This woman has come because she's heard Jesus is there and quite, quite, beyond her own anticipation, what, is, what happens here? She, she's reduced to tears when she sees Jesus. And she bends down, and she's weeping on Jesus' feet. And she wipes them with her hair. And what has she brought with her? She's brought with her this incredible gift. Now, this unnamed woman is, is identified for us as a sinner, which could mean lots of different things at this time. But it's quite easy to put that together with a certain kind of reputation that this woman would have had in her own day, right? And here she is pouring herself out at Jesus' feet with tears, but also with this perfume that would have been costly. An alabaster jar of perfume would have been so costly. And Jesus allows it to happen. And you can just imagine the moment. A bunch of guys all talking with each other, and this woman comes in and does this, and Jesus actually allows this to happen as, as if it's a significant thing, as if it really matters. I want to pause on that for a second. There are a few things, I think, to note 
here about this woman. Clearly, she's just pouring this out freely. No one has told her that she must do this. This is coming of her own free will. But the second thing that's fascinating for me in this is that there's no shame, no hint of shame at all for this woman. Isn't that amazing? She has good reason in this particular situation to feel displaced and out of place in the way that we would experience shame in our lives. Uh, She would know that she's in the home of a Pharisee. Pharisees were all about making a strong distinction between sinners and people who aren't sinners. This woman is unclean from Simon's perspective and like a bit of a contagion or a virus in their midst. That's how they would have all experienced this moment. And she comes right into the midst of it. And instead of in a guarded sort of way, you know, excusing herself and just trying to connect with Jesus a little bit, eye contact and moving on, she is reduced to tears. She pours out this this perfume. And it's this moment, an intimate moment, which would have been cringy for everybody else there, but it's like she doesn't even realize where she is. And it doesn't matter at all. That's remarkable, isn't it? This generosity that overflows. Here's something else that's really important from this little episode from Scripture. We learn that it doesn't come from her. It's not because she's got something special inside of her that's causing her to do this. She just happens, in other words, to be a particularly generous person. Right? She's a giving sort of person or something like that. That's not what we learn from this story. Why is she pouring herself out like this? Because of what she's experienced in her relationship with God in and through Jesus. She has experienced forgiveness with Jesus unexpectedly. She couldn't have imagined the way that she would experience something like that. For uh, In that context, that's a big deal because forgiveness of sin isn't just like uh, a pardon for misdeeds that you've kind of done on the side. It's like, okay, oops, uh, I might do it again, right? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about being excluded from society because of your sin, and then being forgiven of that and welcomed back in where she's been excluded. That's what we're talking about. And she's amazed by this and can't believe it. And that's where this is coming from. She has experienced God's generosity, and God's generosity is just simply flowing out of her, quite beyond her own expectation or or, or imagining. It's all just happening in the moment, and Jesus lets it happen. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And there's Jesus in the midst of it all, challenging now Simon, right, with a little parable. I I love the little parable that he tells, right? It's it's an easy one. Like, Simon's suspicious of Jesus. Clearly, if he was a prophet, he would know who's touching him and and all the rest. And, And Simon thinks that he's got the correct view on everything, mind you, right? That's kind of what's happening here for Simon. He's in the position of being able to judge well and to discern well because he's a Pharisee after all and he knows, he knows what's what. Right. Jesus tells this little story and he invites him to be a discerner, to be a judge with that story. He says, okay, all right, a money lender, 50 denarii to one person, 500 to another person, neither of whom can repay the debt. And that money lender forgives the debt. Who's going to love the money lender more? Hmm. It's an easy one, isn't it? Do you notice what Jesus says to, to, the, to Simon? You've judged correctly. <laughs> we're meant to laugh at that, I think. I think that we're meant to laugh at that. Yes, there's humor in the scriptures. You've got to wait and watch for it, but it's there. Jesus can be really funny. You've judged correctly. Jesus already knows what Simon's thinking, and he's way off base. He's got the wrong frame of reference for what's actually happening in his own home but he treats him as a a wise and discerning and judging sort of person. And then he turns everything around. I love this. Because Jesus isn't just excluding the Pharisees either. He's actually developing friendship. That's partly what's happening in Simon's home here. He's pushing back, but he's doing so in a generous way too. That's part of the story of generosity here. But notice what he does. He then flips everything around and helps Simon to appreciate what this woman has done that Simon has neglected, and that is following through on generous hospitality. And as he does that, and as he elaborates further, 
and further and further, you know what happens for that woman? She is transformed from an unwelcome virus to the host of the whole party. It's her hospitality. Yes, it is cool, Paul. It is cool. Transformed into the host of the whole party. And why? Because she's got all the skills for it, right? Because she's gone to school for it. Because, no, because of just simply this openness to God's mercy and grace and compassion to the point of allowing it to overflow. That's it. That's it. I'm loved, she's saying, and I can't believe it. I'm loved. I'm loved. I can't believe it. Everything's transformed in this particular moment. Awesome, isn't it? This is where generosity comes from. This is where it comes from. Um, next slide, please, John. We just looked at this. Do you see this woman? Clearly, clearly he hadn't. We don't need to go over this again, but notice the, first, the, the last little line there. As her great love has shown, therefore I tell you, her many sins, which have be, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. Get the order order there, right? Where does great love come from? It comes from openness to God's mercy and grace in our lives, and allowing that to move out it comes from God. Next slide, please, John. Thanks. Next little, little example that we have this morning, an entirely different context. Look with me in your bulletin if you'd like. We're in 2 Corinthians, early church. Paul is writing from northern Greece in Macedonia, from those churches, you know, the, uh, Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea. He's writing somewhere up in the north, down to the church in Corinth, south. And he's writing them about a whole host of different matters. His relationship with the Corinthian church has been complicated, to say the least. Right from the very beginning, it's been tricky. And so he's addressing a whole host of issues, but he comes around to this particular issue of generosity in chapters 8 and 9. And it's fascinating how he does this. Paul, from the beginning of his ministry, has been taking up a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. He's not only been going around and sharing the gospel with people and seeing people's lives transformed and upended by the Holy Spirit and all the rest. All that's been happening, but everywhere he's gone, he's expressed a concern for the poor in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem has been suffering through, through a famine. And so right from the very beginning of his, of his ministry, he's been taking up this collection for the poor. And the church in Corinth, they said, hey, we want to contribute to that. That would be awesome. And Paul's like, okay, well, what you want to do is to kind of save up over time. We learn about this at the end of 1 Corinthians. And now he's writing to them. And guess what's happened in the meantime? They expressed really good intentions about joining in with this collection for the poor. And all that cooled. All that cooled once Paul had moved on. Do you know what that's like in your own life? I know what it's like in my life. Really good intentions, right? Oh, that's something that I want to be a part of. That's good to be a part of and so on. And then the person who's been there to share all the information with you and so on is left. It's like, okay, then life happens. <laughs> There's other stuff. Right? And so Paul is writing back to them and saying, hey, remember, remember that pledge? Let me encourage you to follow through on that. Not because I'm after a bottom line, not because there's some sort of grand funding target that I've got in mind. But there are a number of things that have happened since you made that pledge. Guess what's happened up here, Paul says, to the Macedonians, or about the Macedonian um, uh, churches. Guess what's happened up here? They've been so inspired by your example, get this, they've been so inspired by your example to pledge the amount of money that you pledge that they want to join in too, and they're giving not just to their means, but way beyond their means, just for the privilege of being part of the whole thing. And guess what? I'm coming with a few of those people from the Macedonian church for a little visit. And I just don't want you to get caught off guard when I come. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's a funny scenario. Paul's reputation is on the line because he's been singing the praises of the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, they're kind of on the line. Their reputation's on the line because of this pledge. 
But it's hilarious because they have been inspiring the Macedonian churches. That's the scenario. Now imagine that you're a pastor in a situation like that. This is very different than that woman, isn't it? The unnamed woman who just poured herself out quite naturally out of a deep experience of God's grace and mercy and so on. Here, we've got a people, maybe a little bit more like us, on our average day, on an average day, where, yeah, we want to participate, but we're struggling to even know why. It feels remote. We're not sure how to. You're a pastor in a situation like this. What do you say? What do you say? I can tell you what's tempting for me. It would be tempting for me in this scenario to say, hey, remember the commitment you made? Follow through on your commitment, because that's the right thing to do, after all, and apply a little bit of guilt and shame to all of that. That would be my temptation. And why? Well, I'm sad to say that guilt and shame, I rely way too much on that for motivation in my own life, and motivation in, in connection with other people in my life. What does Paul do? He makes much of God's generosity. He, re, he helps the Corinthian church to remember where ge generosity even comes from in the first place. Next slide, please. This is what he writes in chapter 9, and you have it in your bulletins. God is able to bless you abundantly. Not just a little bit, right? to help you to get by and to cope. No, abundantly. It's an overflowing kind of blessing. And it's not like Paul is saying here, hey, we're going to all be the recipients of a, of a lottery win. Right? We're all going to be millionaires. This is awesome. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about an abundant blessing of grace in our lives that's going to enable us to be really open to other people with, with all that's been given. He's able to bless you abundantly. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I love this little metaphor that he's playing on, an agricultural kind of metaphor of sowing and reaping here. The important thing to get is this. Who's the giver? Is it the Corinthian church? It's God who's the giver. Thank you, Paul. God is the giver. He's the one actually with the storehouse of seed. He's the one with the storehouse of seed. What's our responsibility in that? Scattering the seed around. Just in, like in this picture that we have. Mike Moyers, the sower. It was scattering the seed around. All the stuff that's been given to us. If we could just appreciate how much has been given to us, we might be open to scattering it around and realizing it's not just for us, it's for everyone around us. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Here's something else that's really important to note. God is the generous giver. We are the ones who are in the position of receiving that generosity to the point where it overflows to other people. But that's not the end of the story. It's not just a practical issue of meeting people's needs in life and making sure that that's all covered. It is that, but it's more than that. Look at the last verse. And through us, your generosity will result in what? Thanksgiving to God. Notice the circle. God, generous giver, overflowing to us, unexpectedly, amazingly so. It then comes out to everyone. And what happens? It all goes back to God in thanksgiving. That, my friends, isn't just about a funding campaign. That is about life. That's about a Christian life. That's about a life where we're following Jesus and recognizing how deeply loved we are by God. His mercy and grace overflowing for us unexpectedly. We should be in constant amazement and surprise. We don't know what to do with ourselves except to just participate and be involved in it all. That's what Paul is trying to help the Corinthian church to realize in this particular moment. That they would dwell there they would be open to this lavish, gift-giving God that they too might be generous. And it might not even be a second thought for them in their lives. It becomes an automatic thing that follows. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Paul goes on, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and by your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. I just want to, Paul is just elaborating on the very point that he's made, but I just want to want to tie into this. This is about our own witness too. Your generosity, my generosity, it bears witness to God and his generosity. You see? So, yes, it's meant to result in thanksgiving. Just imagine, I, I heard this last, last week when Scott said, he, he declared for us all in the middle of the service, we've got a healthy surplus to this point in the year. There was cheering that was happening, and why? Right? It's not just that we're kind of like, you know, doing well. It's that we, Thanksgiving is just like, it wells up. But it's not just about us, though. Our generosity for one another and within Christian circles isn't just about us. It's about other people looking in on us, saying, wow, what's going on here? Oh, my gosh. These people have no reason to be generous with each other. Look at this motley crew. They hardly even know each other. Some of them aren't even friends. In fact, some of them don't even like each other. But look at the way that they're banding together and somehow there's generosity that's happening in their lives for one another. Where is that coming from? Ah, it all then traces back to the great and generous giver. It's part of our witness. Have you ever wondered, well, how am I witnessing right to God and, and to Jesus in my life? And you might be like wondering how that can happen. Entering into a generous life like this is one way for that to be happening just all the time without even thinking about it. You see? Yeah. Next slide, please. Key to generosity. I've been circling around this. I just want to bring this home right now. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That puts a fine point on how blessing has come to each and every one of us. Not monetary blessing necessarily at all, but great overflowing blessing where we no longer, where we no longer need to imagine, right, that we are hanging in the balance any longer in our lives. We are held secure by God in his love. There could be no better blessing than that. It's something that will carry you through life and beyond life. But it's not just about it being held secure. It's overflow. It's overflow. This is where joy comes from in our lives as well. This is where thanksgiving comes from in our lives as well. You can just start adding on to the great blessing that comes. And how does it come? It's by God giving up and we get the remainder. He's done that for us. Not because... We're awesome, but just because we're loved. And there's no explaining that. There is no explaining it. It's only something to be received, to welcome it, right? and to allow ourselves to get caught up in it to the point we, that, that we ourselves become participants in the thing that God is doing in the world. Next slide, please. I want to read a passage of Scripture conclude our time this morning. Now, before I do, I want to tell this little story because this all came home to me yesterday in a really powerful moment. Some of you will know what this production is about every year. Yeah? I feel like dancing. Do you, do you know this production that's put on at the Sarnia Library? Um, it's put on by, um, by young adults, 21 years and, and older, who, who have uh, developmental disabilities. They call them exceptionalities. I love that. Right? And it's so singing, dancing, jokes are told, and it's participatory too. We had flags that we were waving, clapping. We were getting up and dancing a little bit ourselves. And we left on such a high note, it was amazing. But what was amazing, more amazing than all of that even, was watching right at the end, after they did their two bows, one dad leapt up on stage because his sons were up there. One son who was in a wheelchair nonverbal, who had participated in the, in the whole production, and another son who was up there as well. And what did he do? He just 
lavished them with hugs. <laughs> he just lavished them with hugs. Not like, it's amazing. And you could see, oh, now I get why, why they were so generous in their performance. You have parents like that who just lavish you with love. It's like it, it all comes out. And they were so happy and proud in that moment. But, but the overflow was already happening for them in the way that they were so generous with performing. And here's, here's something else that happened. We left, got back into our car, and we were talking about all of our f- favorite moments from the production, and we ended up at the grocery store. Rosie and, and uh, Mandy went into the grocery store because it's Father's Day, and they wanted to get a little special something or other. And I was waiting, and they came back with this funny story. They went in, and there was a song on, and they started dancing down the aisle. Grocery store. They're dancing in the aisle. And because they're partly just taking what they've experienced, right, in this production with them. And they're dancing in the aisle having so much fun. Here's the beautiful part, though. A guy that they don't even know started dancing with them. Isn't that awesome? He went by. I don't have any dance moves, so that wasn't very good. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that encapsulate what we're talking about in terms of generosity? Generosity begets generosity, and it is all rooted in God. Right? That's what we're talking about here. And we need to be refreshed constantly in that. Because, my friends, we are not enough. We are not enough for, for that. We will get tired and worn out if we imagine or behave as if we are the source of, of generosity in the world. We will get worn down. We will not make it. But if we constantly come back and recognize that God is the source of generosity, ah, we're open to life again, to refreshment, right? To realizing, oh, goodness, it doesn't depend all on me. Oh, wow, and I get to take part, but I'm not leading the show. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture for us. It comes from Ephesians chapter 1. What I want you to do, and I'm going to invite you to do, is to close your eyes when I read this passage of Scripture. That might feel a little strange. We are in church, though. It's okay. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. What we have here are all a list of the great blessings, the great blessings that we enjoy in Jesus that we too often are forgetting. I want you, as you close your eyes, to be open, to open your hearts, Open your minds, ready to receive this word which is going to be spoken over you. It was written in the first century. It's meant for us in the 21st century. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. How blessed is God. And what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, He decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What a pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We're free people free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on all the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan, in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, 
He had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Thanks be to God.